to Texas Art Institute educational programs on innovative technologies and techniques. Uh, we are talking about breaking the barriers in endovascular interventions. I'm your host. My name is Von Rukrejer. I'm an interventional cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and Baylor CHI Medical uh, Center. Uh, special guest today is Dr. Mahdi Rizavi, and he's an interventionalist and also electrophysiologist Correct. at Texas Heart Institute and the Baylor College of uh, Medicine. And uh, it's, it's a very exciting time to have Dr. Rizavi here on this occasion because he's not only an interventionalist and electrophysiologist, but innovator in the field of uh, vascular and cardiovascular medicine. Thank you for joining us for this special event. Thank you for having me. So uh, the topic is the latest advances in diagnosis and prevention of vascular complications. This is a serious problem. Technology however, continues to drive towards less invasive solutions. And also payers and hospitals demand better resource utilization and also demand to find a way to reduce the cost of the procedure. As far as uh, transfemoral access site complications are concerned, one of the most common one is hematoma, and it varies tremendously depending on the patient's anatomy and also on the operator experience, but there, it ranges somewhere between 1 to 10 percent of the diagnostic and interventional procedures. Pseudoaneurysm is another relatively common complication that occurs between 1 to 6 percent of uh, patients, and this certainly can carry significant consequences and occasionally requires surgical intervention. Intimal dissection is another complication that occurs with aggressive manipulation of catheters and wires in the arterial system. Access site closure or thrombosis is relatively rare occurrence, but it occurs in less than 1% of cases. There also is an AV fistula that occurs occasionally with uh, less than optimal access to the arterial uh, anatomy and circulation. And of course, one of the most dramatic and uh, concerning complication is vessel laceration or avulsion that is relatively rare, rare, but it can lead to catastrophic uh, events. Retroperitoneal hem hemorrhage related to perforation or laceration or avulsion is a very serious complication that frequently will require surgical intervention. There's also risk of nerve damage, embolization to the lower extremity, risk of infection, particularly the access site, and venous thrombosis. Now, we know the challenging anatomy increases the risk of access site complications. One of the most common challenges as far as the access site is concerned is severe calcification of the common femoral artery, which can present itself with either minor calcification or major anterior wall calcification or circumferential calcification. Another scenario that adds to the risk of complication is iliac artery complication and iliac artery tortuosity that is shown here on this slide. Morbid obesity is a problem for a great majority of interventions because of the distance that occurs between the skin and the femoral artery, like in this particular scenario is over 11 centimeters. And most of the devices that we have available for access are um, difficult to deploy in this particular scenario. One of the great concerns with uh, less than optimal access or so-called blind access without using intravascular ultrasound or paying attention to anatomy is access that's above the inguinal ligament that can lead to retroperitoneal bleeding and severe consequences. Aggressive sheath manipulation in a narrow or diseased or tortuous vessel can also cause vessel laceration and avulsion as it is seen here on the right hand side with so-called iliac on a stick type of a finding. This should be avoided by all means because this usually leads to catastrophic retroperitoneal bleeding and the need for emergent surgical treatment. Now, we all know from experiences and the literature that significant delay in diagnosis of bleeding 
can cause serious complications. Current protocols, unfortunately, still rely on symptomatology for detection, which can take hours to develop and add to significant complications and consequences that we have to deal with later. There is a report from a single center where incidence of uh, after catheterization retroperitoneal bleeding occurs in 40% of uh, patients um, uh, and uh, leads to a hemo hemorrhagic complications and hemorrhagic shock. This type of occurrence usually is very insidious and it happens really slowly in a lot of instances, particularly if the uh, perforation or laceration is relatively small and typically will be manifested uh, sometimes 15 or 30 minutes after the intervention is completed. So it is very important to address this type of a problem related to the bleeding and complication as early as possible and identify it before it becomes a serious problem. Now, Dr. Rizavi, how big is this problem in your particular experience as far as bleeding is concerned? And what is the impact on the cost of the procedure uh, related to this type of complication? Thank you, Dr. Krasier. Uh, bleeding, it's a big problem. It's a major problem. Uh, it's, a, it's a problem that affects not only the patient's uh, short-term outcome, but their long-term outcome. Uh, if you bleed, your chances of uh, a delayed recovery from a procedure increase, the chances of you dying in the hospital increase, and certainly the cost to the hospitalization increases significantly. Here you can see uh, that bleeding complications uh, rate associated with large bore arterial procedures are as high as 18 uh, percent across the board. Uh, and when they happen, you have a double uh, the risk of uh, death, and uh, you have increased the cost of hot, the health care cost uh, to the system by about 60 percent. Um, and why do we have a need for early detection? Uh, again, as I said, it's frequent, it's expensive and it occurs in one in five patients, and when it happens, uh, you can die, you know, almost uh, with the inc double the increased uh, risk of death. Uh, and so something has to be done about it. Uh, how expensive is this problem? It's very expensive. Uh, in the United States, if you look at a, across a, a data set of patients uh, in, who were entered into the Medicare system, the CMS system, an analysis of the CMS system showed that the cost is upwards of $1.5 billion um, with uh, an 18 percent complication rate and 450,000 uh, procedures that were analyzed. Uh, on the average, uh, it was an $18,000 average additional cost uh, of a bleeding complication when it happened. So this is a very serious problem. So that is interesting and surprising to a certain degree. So what can be done to prevent vascular access site complications? Sure. Well, um, it's, uh, it's a canary in the coal mine, right? Uh, early detection is absolutely critical. Uh, to, to managing these patients. These bleeds are, t are not, uh, you know, they're not bleeders. It's not as if a surgeon has sliced through a large artery. They are leaks, but the problem is that the leaks are not detected frequently enough uh, and early enough so that the uh, physician does not have an opportunity to intervene. The early bleed monitoring system um, is a system that can be used that can detect the onset and progression of bleeding during procedures, not only during procedures as they're happening, but immediately after procedures too. If I may interrupt, uh, you're an inventor, and can you tell me a little bit, uh, you actually participated in the invention of this device. This is uh, the early bird system, as you can see it, and you can also see it on the screen. And uh, as you can see here, it has uh, markers that tell you about severity of bleeding. So if you don't mind, can you uh, tell me a little bit how did it evolve, uh, what was your process of thinking, and how it works? Sure. And so you're hearing these audible tones. These audible tones are giving uh, the kind of a signaling the progression of a bleed from the onset of the bleed 
as it progresses and whether or not it progresses or not based on what the physician has done to intervene. So not only is it onset, but is the physician's uh, maneuvering or the physician's intervention at that point affecting the progression of the bleed. And this will be the third and uh, final beep as it uh, marks the progression uh, process. The way I uh, initially came up with this concept was we had just finished a procedure and um, after the procedure, the patient had had a significant drop in their blood pressure. By then, I was, you know, as it happens often, you're traveling between hospitals, and I was in the middle of traffic, and they called me and they said, your patient's blood pressure has dropped, what to do? And I thought to myself, I wish there was a way that I could actually find out right now if the bleeding is ongoing or not. And um, I, I did so by, you know, right at that moment I thought to myself, well, you know, there are certain variables that we look for in the field of electrocardiac electrophysiology. And one of, these field, one of these variables is resistance of tissue. That's something that's commonly analyzed when we do our work. Um, and so my thought was, I wonder if blood in that field would change the resistance of the tissue. And it turns out, you know, one thing led to another, and it does. And it does so very, very uh, precisely and very, very reproducibly. This is very visionary. I am well, really thank impressed. You. So thank you. resistance plays a significant role and impedance yes. uh, to the blood flow. And so tell me a little bit about how was this catheter designed to address this uh, issue? There are few components there that need to um, be explained to our audience uh, how this system works. You already showed that we have alarm system, which is visual and also uh, audible, but also there are sensors there that Correct. play a significant role. So if you don't mind mentioning that part again. So the, the, the meat of the matter actually, in fact, are those sensors that you see. Those You see those four ring electrodes uh, in pairs, two closer to the and at the tip and then two closer to the area and the hub uh, and the, what we call the proximal aspect. And what's happening is soon as you insert that sheath, otherwise, except for what you see that is con uh, connected to the actual sheath itself, which is the, the um, uh, processing um, information and the software and the hardware of the devices is uh, housed in, in, in what we call the hub or in the um, uh, flushing port of the of the catheter itself and so what happens is uh, soon as the uh, device is inserted uh, in a standard way without any difference from what you do in a normal um, standard cell dinger technique be it with vascular ultrasound guidance or not or micropuncture needle or not once the uh, sheath is placed in uh, the electrodes do two things a pair of electrodes emit a very high frequency and very low intensity uh, electrical stimulus. This intensity is much, much lower than anything required to, for example, capture or irritate the nerves or, or the muscle. So there's no twitching or anything like that. The other pair of electrodes are measuring the resistance to the current that was just applied. And as we all know, um, you know, electricity really likes to conduct through salt water and blood after all is a glorified form of salt water. And so as blood is being introduced into that space because of this slow leak, you see that the level of resistance, what we call the bioimpedance, just a fancy way of discussing that resistance to electrical current, starts decreasing because the blood is enabling that current to move faster and more easily. And so with the onset of a bleed, you start noticing on the right side figure, you can see that there is a, um, there's a beginning of a drop in the impedance. And as the bleeding progresses, that drop goes on and on. Um, that's how we enable the onset and tracking of the extent of bleeding. Now, if you were to do an intervention and you would see that the onset of the bleeding has happened and you, know, you would use whatever technique the clinician or the operator may want to use, to abort that bleeding, you would see that that level would taper off. That drop would taper off and you would say, okay, whatever I've done, I have now been successful, there's no more bleeding. And so the device tells you not only when it happens, but also when it stops. This is very ingenious. Yeah. I mean, really to use the impedance to figure out how much of blood loss yes, occurs sir. and to quantify it, that's truly ingenious type of approach. And not only that you can do this intra-procedure, but also post-procedure. Yep. 
And uh, another great advantage is that um, there are two de devices or two uh, sheets or systems that are available. One is six French and the other one is eight French. So they're relatively small in size. Yes. And typically, I have been one of the investigators in a clinical trial that was carried on. You typically place it adjacent to the femoral artery access site so it can read uh, any problems related to the large bore sheets that occurs in proximity to that particular uh, catheter. And we used it on numerous occasions at our institution and we have found that it was very sensitive tool in identifying bleeding, even minor degree of, degree of bleeding, which was absolutely fascinating. Now, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about validation of this technology. How did you actually get to the point to say, well, this is a reliable means of assessing bleeding? Sure. So uh, we did a series of, first of all, we uh, met with the FDA and sought guidance from them. The FDA thought that this could be done, and the, the clearance could be achieved uh, in a series of preclinical studies without having to resort to, to clinical cases. And so we followed suit. Uh, it, it, there was 40 sample sizes, uh, samples, uh, experiments with uh, the groins on either side. And what we would see is uh, kind of what's depicted here that there was a correlation not only with the onset of introduction of fresh blood into that site, but with the progression. We controlled the onset and the progression of bleeding by introducing uh, fresh blood. And we would see that uh, the device would track the onset and it would track the propagation of the bleeding very, very accurately. And the amount. And the amount, correct. And that correlated with the amount. As, uh, we as you can, can see, see here, here yes. from level one to level three. Yes which, uh, again, even the minute changes in the uh, amount of bleeding was detected with this particular Correct. technique. Correct. And this shows you uh, this bleeding signature, if you want to explain it a little yes. bit further. So you can see in the beginning, we'll start on the, on the we'll x-axis, if you will, the unit is time, and you don't need to right now worry about those precise numbers. And the y-axis, uh, the unit is the resistance. Um, and and uh, you know, at the bottom, at where it says 20, the resistance is low, and all the way up um, uh, at the highest uh, box, around um, 60 or so, or even higher, um, you, I'm sorry, 40 or so, or even higher, you can see the higher resistance. So at the beginning, we start the procedure at time zero, and then what we do is, uh, uh, you can see as we're moving rightward in time, we introduce the bleeding, and you see that there's a downward, obvious downward drift of that impedance. And again, as blood is being introduced, resistance decreases, and therefore that on that X axis, as time is going on, you see it, that downward drift on the, on the Y axis. And as it's going lower and lower, the device triggers. It says that, okay, now the bleeding is ongoing, and then as it progresses, the device keeps up and, um, and does so in a very uh, sensitive and specific way. And what do I mean by sensitive and specific? Sensitivity means that uh, how good are you at picking up a, an event? Specific means how reliable are you in picking up an event? In other words, if you are sensitive, uh, you're, you don't miss any events from happening. If you're specific, if you say, and you, that means that if you declare an event has happened, an event has happened. There's no false alarms, if you will. So the device not only can pick up everything, it doesn't even give you any false alarms. When it goes off, that means that the real deal is happening. So uh, that, that's very, very powerful. This is really impressive. I, I don't recall any study where we had a 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. Yeah. That's, uh, in most of the scenarios, wishful thinking. But so tell me, what was the next step after the animal uh, uh, study? And uh, talk a little bit about, uh, uh, again, you mentioned it before, biopedia's response and blood loss as far as quantifying the amount of blood loss. Yes. So, you know, as, as and, and, you know, this is a somewhat of an arbitrary, but we think a clinically valid number that if 500 um, mLs of bleed is currently probably around what you've done when you start, by the time you start having symptoms such as a drop in blood pressure or pain in the flank or things of that nature. And we wanted to correlate our level of detection with what is right now clinically uh, the, the, the threshold. And as you can see here, by the time you get 
to that 500 ml bleed, you've already had a significant 30% drop in the resistance of that omega sign stands for ohms, which is a unit for resistance. Um, you've had a 30% drop in the resistance of conduction. And we have detected, we detected the onset well, well before. You see the third line is around where it would have been, and we have detected it well to the left, much earlier uh, before you know what clinically would have been detectable. So the early bird would start beeping. Yes. And you would go to the third marker if this happens. Yes. Which is very reliable, and very important and meaningful information. So uh, obviously the next step was a clinical trial. That is exactly right. And uh, tell tell us a little bit about the clinical trial. So the tr uh, clinical trial was a multi-center study um, in a I. I I believe the exact number escapes me. I think it was, uh, yeah, there was five clinical sites uh, across the country, uh, different operators in each site. And, and we were one of the centers. You were kind enough. Yes, you uh, were one of uh, uh, the centers. And, um, and the end point uh, was assessing whether or not the use of this sheath uh, would detect the bleeding and what the correlation was between the devices triggering and the actual um, uh, event. So what happened is you would do the procedure as per normal. We would get a CAT scan, a CT scan uh, after the procedure, and you would, we would correlate uh, the number of lights that have gone off, if any, with the extent of bleed, if any, found on the CT scan. So now you have a correlation between my a set number of lights have gone off. Now let's see how much bleeding was detected. And now you could compare apples to apples, if you will. Uh, these were done in a variety of uh, high-risk uh, arterial large bore uh, procedures. Uh, and that is here, you know, shown on the uh, diagram here. TAVR was the most common procedure. was, correct. correct. And, uh, <clears throat> but other interventions were done yes. as well as uh, PCI, uh, the use of an impeller device for hemodynamic support, uh, balloon valvuloplasty, mitral clip, uh, and EVAR as well. So uh, we really tested this device in all kind of scenarios Correct. and a variety of the procedures. Now, uh, the procedural characteristics are uh, included here, and we can see that the great majority of patients actually underwent procedures with the use of large bore sheets, which is 12 French or higher, all the way up to 24 French for uh, EVAR, TVAR, and TAVR like uh, procedures. So a variety of procedures were performed with different size of uh, sheet sizes. And this is very important because we wanted to know if this device is sensitive for all sheet sizes, not just for small ones, but also for large ones as well. And uh, a large uh, variety of closure devices was also used. Uh, as we can see, uh, ProGlide was the most common closure device used in 82% of cases. This is a very popular large bore closure device, followed by ProStar XL, AngioSeal. There were also patients with manual compression and uh, crossover balloon and, uh, and so on. But uh, the important thing is that uh, a lot of closure devices were used in this particular study. So. Tell us uh, about early bird results. Now, this is probably the essence of this. That's right. Uh, how close is it to the animal study and whether we can use this in everyday clinical applications? I, I think uh, the, the short answer is that it's, it's close. Uh, we saw that, uh, uh, here's kind of a rundown, and about a about a third of the cases, there was no bleed detected. Uh, and about a third of the cases, uh, there was a level one that triggered. And then about a third of the cases, there was either a level two or a level three. That's, uh, that's concerning because this is like 32% uh, of patients. One almost had, had more than mild amount of bleeding, which is really bothersome. And it tells us if we don't have means of assessing it, we can get ourselves and the patient in trouble. Absolutely. I do want to quantitate or uh, kind of qualify one thing. It, it, my feeling on this is that probably a level two or three is where it's going to become a problem, somewhere in that zone. Um, maybe that a level two, if you've stopped the bleeding by then, you're going to be okay, probably. But if it hits a level three, that you're probably going to, you know, that, that there's things are getting uh, worse and you need to 
take more aggressive and drastic action. So maybe you can share with us some of the information. When did that bleeding occur or alarm occurred as far as something bad is happening? Sure. How often was it intra-procedure and how often was it post-procedure? And the answer is it was usually post-procedure. And is that surprising? Actually, probably not. Uh, it was that, surprising to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I thought that you know when you're in the in the lab itself when you're still doing the procedure everyone is paying attention everyone is focused on the patient uh, they're being monitored it I, I thought that after the procedure when now kind of the attention level may be a little bit less intense that they're perhaps in the holding area and and things may not be as closely monitored that you would have uh, you would run into trouble. Um, and so, uh, one way or another, about 70% were post-procedural. Amazing. Yeah. This is absolutely amazing. The bottom line is how reliable, how sensitive it is. Of course, the gold standard at the present time to identify significant amount of bleeding with large bore sheets is CT scan yes. assessing retroperitoneal bleed. So maybe you can mention this uh, and what was found. So we found that you know there was in about a uh, little less than a little you know less than 10% of cases there was absolutely no changes in the vast majority in about 60% there was what we would call infiltration or what the radiologist would call infiltration and I would uh, say that that is where you that you need to know that it's happening, but you don't. If you can control it, there probably isn't going to be any long-term sequelae. And then another third uh, had a what we could call a hematoma, which can, depending on its size, can have uh, effects. And this is pretty generous what we can see in this particular yes, example. That's right. So that patient usually has symptoms related. Yes. To it. And then we did not find any retroperitoneal bleeds, which is to be expected given the reported incidence, which is um, you know, quite you know, in the 1% range or so. So we did not find, uh, there were no retroperitoneal bleeds. In and, this and this study. is partially, I believe, true because uh, truly experts were involved in this yes, clinical trial. that is absolutely we, correct. We pay attention to the yes. details. So, but it happens, it happens. It can happen to anybody. So that is something that uh, would have to be evaluated yes. even further in some other type of a trial. But so tell us a little bit more about uh, primary endpoint and accuracy uh, as far as level one, level two, and level three is concerned. And tell us about what is Cohen's kappa. Not all of us are familiar with it. So uh, what it what it is doing is that there is it's talking about the correlation between your findings and, and a combination of the, what I was saying earlier, the sensitivity and the specificity, the, the what we call the positive predictive value and the specificity, which is um, if you say the, the incidence of false alarms or the reverse of the incidence of false alarms. So if your specificity is 100%, that means you had no false alarms, right. essentially. And you can see that you know, these numbers are quite you know, robust. Um, if it said that you don't have a bleed or if you have a minimal bleed, you, you did not have a bleed. If it alerted, something was going on. Right. And then you see that at the level two, uh, the specificity was a little bit lower. That is to say that it may have a slightly overcalled some stuff, not in terms of saying the onset of a bleed, but the progression to a level two bleed. And that kind of makes sense because when you're in a level two on one but on one, your neighbor on one end is very low or no bleeding. Your neighbor on the other end is extensive bleeding. So it becomes a little bit more grayish uh, in terms of differentiating. So that probably is you know, to be expected and gives us the slightly lower specificity. And again, the specificity for, one, um, for the highest level of bleed is yeah. 100% as was the sensitivity. Yeah, level three is the most important yeah, one. Yeah, that's, that's right. And uh, you know, I give presentations on this topic and frequently I'm asked questions, what about this level two? Why uh, you know, the specificity is not as high and uh, I always answer, and maybe it's incorrect, there is also a hum human component added to it. It depends who reads the CAT scan yes, that's right. and how aggressive or less aggressive they are interpreting the findings because there is no standardization as far as reading the CT and the amount of bleeding is concerned. It's uh, to a certain degree subjective. Yes, Don't you think that that plays a role? Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so very interesting. So what are the clinical actions that were taken during the study uh, 
based on the information that was provided to the interventionalist. Sure. So uh, in about, uh, you know, a majority, vast majority of cases, about 75% of cases, the uh, physician uh, was no when they were notified, they said, okay, let's just uh, continue observation, and that's all they did, because again, think about the times that you had a level one or a level two that, not, that did not progress. Uh, about a third of the times, they would, um, and, and I just want to make a point that, that you see that the numbers are adding up over 100%, because they could have done a number of different things or multiple uh, interventions at the same time. So about a fifth of the time, they just uh, did the manual compression, 15% uh, of the time, they did the uh, crossover balloon technique. Obviously, that is still while they're doing the procedure, uh, because you know once the patient is in the holding area, you can't uh, you, after the procedure you can't do that. About 13% of the patients required um, a transfusion, and then 5% um, uh, required the fem stop, and um, and um, one patient had their anticoagulation reversed. So this is very interesting because uh, when we look at the need for transfusion, it's, it's, it's pretty high considering uh, what is the current uh, status as far as large bore sheets and transfusion. It has dropped tremendously, uh, obviously related to expertise, uh, paying attention, uh, using newer generation closure devices, and so on. It's somewhere in the range of about 7%. So it means that um, uh, the, the physicians were alerted relatively early and they checked the uh, hemoglobin and hematocrit and found it was very low and uh, therefore found a reason to uh, give a blood transfusion. But there was a significant number of interventions actually performed on the basis of this uh, information. So that is very important and very, very meaningful information. So, so how does the early birth system compare to existing options, what we've been doing until now? Well, um, unfortunately, um, up to now, there really has not been much uh, that has been done other than waiting for the clinical um, presentation. Um, intraprocedurally, especially, we're quite limited uh, because doing any kind of real-time imaging intraprocedurally, it's already such a crowded field that it's just not feasible to be uh, doing, you know, CT scans or ultrasounds. Uh, the vascular access ultrasounds that we often use are too underpowered to penetrate deeper into the tissue to give us good imaging uh, of, of potential um, deeper retroperitoneal bleeds and the like. The CT scan, obviously, it's not really feasible. And so really what you have is the standard sheath and uh, the clinical um, uh, clinical presentation. And um, so, so it's also the cost sure. issue oh, and, and a, time issue sure. yeah. that play a significant role. So I see major advantages of using this particular system when uh, it tells you that there is a problem and you don't have to transfer a patient to the uh, radiology suite, uh, particularly the patient is hemodynamically unstable or the ultrasound equipment might not be available or is suboptimal in identifying the problem. So those are very uh, important uh, things. I, I would add one point also, and that's the specificity. If you have a patient who's critically ill, who's in the ICU, who has multiple lines and devices, and you get a report that they're hypotensive, and the sheath has not detected a drop in impedance, you are virtually assured that bleeding is not the problem. And you don't have to then take uh, the the uh, the time and the effort and the, you know it, transporting these patients can be very very challenging and, and you can really start focusing quickly on other causes of the drop in blood pressure as opposed to bleeding in the access site. So, what does the future hold for um, early bird as far as there is always a first generation, second generation, mm -hmm. and third generation? Of course, there are needs, there are unmet needs. Uh, I mean, I'm an interventional cardiologist or interventionalist, um, and not only that I would like to know if the patient is bleeding, I would like to know where yes. the patient is bleeding. Is it just uh, at the access site, or is it in the retroperitoneum, whether it's in the pelvis or it's higher up, and all of those things that uh, would be very useful and meaningful 
in preventing further complications. So do you envision any progress? Another thing is, uh, could we have uh, one, two, three, and four? Yes. Four would be big bleeding, big retrovenal bleeding that we didn't see in this particular scenario. Of course, we get more alerted and worried if there is a major, major retrovenal bleeding occurring. So if you don't mind to answer this. Yes. Uh, so that is exactly what uh, you have read our minds. And, and the thought is, you know, is there a way by either, you know, do we, is it requiring more electrodes? Is it requiring a longer sheath? Is it requiring fine tuning of the algorithm? But indeed, the first question, can we help in any way to localize the event? And that's, that is, you know, something that we are very um, um, focused on at this time. And then um, I think uh, in kind of a, 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 a converse of that is to say, okay, let's kind of see whether or not we can make this more applicable to the general um, uh, population. Patients who have central lines in the ICU, um, patients who are going P undergoing PCIs but not necessarily with the largest bore sheaths, patients who are doing electrophysiology ablations, uh, such as what I do uh, for a living. Um, will this become a standard of care in the ICUs and the CCUs for monitoring? And so um, as we are trying to make it more specific to give the operator and the interventionist um, uh, more specific data, where is the bleed? We also want to see if we can uh, take this to a broader patient population outside of the realm of interventions. Very, very interesting. Well, Dr. Rezavi, thank you very much for sharing with us this very important and valuable information. And this truly belongs in uh, breaking the barriers in endovascular interventions. And I believe personally this is going to simplify and make our procedure better and safer for our patients. So thank you very thank much. Thank you very and much. Congratulations. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.